welcome to Holy Spirit Anglican this day. Uh, a little bit cloudy, but we'll bring some light into, into this place here. Uh, it is 10.02, so we're going to pray for uh, church plant. Uh, we're going to pray for St. Paul City Church in Murnia, California. Uh, Father uh, Joseph Acton is the priest there. Heavenly Father, we lift up uh, St. Paul City. Um, we pray that you would uh, be with them during this time. Uh, bless them. We know that uh, California has, has been hit hard uh, with COVID, and we know that uh, there are a lot of obstacles in the way towards a church growing right now. And so we pray that you would remove those obstacles. Bless the, the people that attend the church. Bless uh, Father Joseph. Uh, and bless those that are touched by uh, their outreach and their ministry. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn is Amen. Come Not Far. Please stand. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. 
Spirit. Let us pray. The collect of the day. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of Holy Scriptures. First reading today is from 1 Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet got out, gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am. And ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. The Lord said, and Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling upon the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay down until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the, the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, and he said, Here I am. And Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do to you and more. Also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew, and the Lord with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today is 63. Please read at the top first responsibly. O oh God, you are my God. Eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh thanks for you. As in a barren and dry land where there is no water. Therefore I have gazed upon you in your holy place. That I may behold your power and your glory. For your loving kindness is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. So will I bless you as long as I live. And lift up my hands in your name. 
My soul is content as with morrow and fatness. And my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed, and meditate on you in the night watches. For you have been my helper. And under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul clings to you. Your right hand holds me fast. May those who seek my life to destroy it go down into the depths of the earth. Let them fall upon the edge of the sword. And let, let them be food for generals. But the king will rejoice in God. All oh. those who swear by him will be glad. For the mouth of those who speak by him shall be stopped. The official reading this morning is 1 Corinthians. Chapter 6, verses 9 through 20. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God raised the Lord, and will also raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? Or as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him, free from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Our gospel hymn this morning is Over a Thousand Tongues. We'll sing the first three verses and then the last two after the gospel. Please stand. Philip was from Bethsaida, 
the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Now Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. in the Bible. Moses says, here I am. 
Isaiah says, here I am. And, and here I am is, is really uh, a way of saying, I'm your servant. I, I'm ready to serve you. I'm ready to do uh, what it takes uh, in order to, to do your will. And so Eli, or Samuel is saying that to Eli, um, although eventually he says it to God. And so in verses 8 through 9, Eli tells Samuel, Eli finally figures out what's going on, and he, and he instruct, instructs Samuel on how to answer God's call. You know, and so even though Eli isn't the greatest priest, he at least figures it out. And he instructs Samuel. And he plays a part in Samuel's calling. And so this time God speaks in verse 10. Not only does he speak, but he actually comes and stands. In other words, not only do we hear God's voice, but Samuel actually has a vision of God, which is remarkable because the word of the Lord and visions were rare in those days. And Samuel answers, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Again, one of those one-liners. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. I challenge you this week to pray that prayer in the morning or in the evening before you go to bed and see what happens. I'd be willing to bet that God meets you there. But, but that, again, is, is this idea that, that I'm listening and, and I'm willing to do what you tell me to do. And so Samuel's very first instruction for the Lord is not something that we would necessarily hope to say to someone. God says that what I'm about to do is going to make the ears of everyone tingle. Um, that was a saying back then that basically said, you're going to hear something that is, is profound and kind of um, uh, severe judgment. Okay, so... So, so here's this poor boy who really hasn't met God yet, and he says, okay, speak, I'm listening, and God says, okay, well, I want you to, to proclaim some bad news. And, and God goes on to tell him that basically um, Eli and, and everything that, that, um, that God has already proclaimed about Eli, which is some pretty bad stuff, is going to come about. And so Samuel is afraid to say what God has told him to say. I would be too. <laughs> I mean, here I'm living with this guy who's, who's kind of been my benefactor and now I'm supposed to tell him that God said he's going to destroy him and, and his whole house. But here's a, another good thing about Eli. Eli actually asks for the message. He says, tell me what you've heard. And so Samuel tells him, and, and I love this. At, at the end there, Eli says this, it is the Lord let him do what seems good to him. And, and it actually brought to my mind Mary. Let it, be with me, let it be to me according to your will. I mean, they're basically the same kind of, of statement. And again, pretty radical one-liner. <laughs> you know, let it be according to God's will. And, and that is, is a lot of giving up, letting go. And so then we hear that Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. In other words, everything that, that Samuel said bore fruit. And, and he did that because God was with him. So that's Samuel, and we'll kind of come back to, to some examples and stuff. But let's, let's turn to, to John. And I'm actually going to start a little bit earlier, so I'll read to you. Um, starting with verse 35, and this is, this is when Jesus calls the first disciples, okay? So, um, chapter 1, verse 35 goes like this. It says, The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. 
He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. We brought him to Jesus. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. And then we get into the scripture for today. So um, let me take you back again to, to verse 35. John uh, the Baptist directs his apostles' attention to Jesus. Look at God, the Lamb of God. And as a result, the disciples follow. Jesus then asks another one liner, what are you seeking? Jesus always asks questions. Questions that really make you think, what are you seeking? And they, they said, you know, where do you live? They're, they're basically saying, we'd like to be your disciples. And, and he says, come and see. And then they remain with him during the day. And, and so just in that little brief section there, you have kind of the summary of discipleship. You have somebody directing towards Jesus. You have this idea of following, of come and see, of remaining. All of those are, are part of fellowship, or are part of discipleship. As we are disciples of Christ, we follow him, we remain with him. We come and see where he's going. So in verse 40, Andrew goes and gets his brother. He spent a day with Jesus, and the first thing that he does after that is he goes and gets his brother, and he says, we have found the Messiah. And he brings him to Jesus. So in verse 43, which is where our scripture reading began today, it's the next day. And Jesus goes and he finds Philip. Now, it's, it's interesting that um, previously people sought out Jesus. John the Baptist said, look, there's the Lamb of God, and, and Andrew and this other person went to Jesus. And, and there are several other times where people go to Jesus, but this time Jesus is actually going to Philip. He's seeking him out. That's unusual for a rabbi, a teacher at that time, the students would come to him, not the other way around. But this is what happens, and, and Jesus sees him, and he says, follow me. Then it goes on, and, and here again, what happens after that? Philip goes and he finds Nathaniel. And he says, we found him. The one that, that the Old Testament talks about, the one that the law talks about and the prophets talk about, it's him. Nathaniel's a little bit skeptical. In fact, he, he doesn't believe it. He's kind of scorning and rejecting what, what Philip says. How could anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see. Come and see. When they get to Jesus, there's kind of this weird interchange between Jesus and, and Nathaniel. And, and the background behind that is that this is all kind of referring back to Jacob. And if you remember, Jacob uh, became Israel. Um, and Jacob was a trickster. He was a deceiver. He was always tricking people out of, out of flocks and sheep and things like that. And, and yet... Here, in contrast, Jesus sees Nathaniel and he says, look, here's someone with no deceit in him. The opposite of Jacob. And then the, at the very end there, when Jesus says, you will see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, that's a reference again to when Jacob was coming home and he lay down and he had a vision. Jacob's ladder, sometimes we call it, where the angels are going up and down from heaven. And Jacob called that place Bethel, which means house of God. Because that was the place that heaven and earth were meeting. Jesus is saying, I am that place. He's saying, you will see the angels of heaven ascending and descending upon the Son of God. On me, Jesus. And so he's making claim to that. So that's kind of the, the, the background behind this weird interchange about what's going on there. But, but here's the thing. Jesus knew about... Nathaniel, before Nathaniel knew about him. Jesus says, I saw you over there. 
Jesus says, I know that you are a man without deceit. And then Nathaniel reacts in a big way. Uh, Nathaniel calls him teacher, but he also calls him savior and king. So these are, and, and this, is, this whole thing is an amazing section of scripture in terms of things that Jesus is called. We're still in the first chapter of John. And listen to this. Jesus has been called the Lamb of God. He's been called Rabbi. He's been called the Messiah and the Christ. He's been called Him of whom the law and the prophets wrote. He's been called the Son of God, the King of Israel, and the Son of Man. And we're not even done with the first chapter. All of that is, is wrapped up into this. And, and so, so what does this have to do with evangelism and, and, and preaching the gospel? Well, let's look at Samuel. One writer, here I am. And then the other one, speak for your servant is listening. Evangelism requires, first and foremost, a willingness to serve God. That means that we need to obey his word. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. That means that we need to follow where he leads. Go over there. Come over here. It means that we need to speak to the people that he tells us to speak to. means that we have to say what he tells us to say, which can be hard sometimes. And we need to do these things even when it feels uncomfortable because it's good enough. And even when we don't want to, because there's going to be times when we don't want to, because it's uncomfortable. But being able to say, here I am, means that we're willing to do those things. And so, first and foremost, brothers and sisters, we need to ask ourselves, are we ready to say that? Because if we're not, we're not going to share the gospel. What about Eli and John the Baptist? Here's the thing. God can use anyone to share the gospel. He can use a run-down priest like Eli. Eli was still a part of Samuel's calling. And look at what Samuel did. He christened kings. God can use a crazy prophet who's dressed in, in hair and eats locusts. Both of those, Eli and John the Baptist, this is what they did. They directed people's attention towards God who was already entering into their lives. Eli basically when you hear that voice say speak Lord for your servant is listening. When you hear God who's already talking in your life, Samuel I want you to listen. So here's some, some thoughts that I just came up with last night. Some, some, some real life examples of that if you will. So if we were going to follow Eli's example and prompt someone to listen to what God is already saying in their life, you might say something like this. What is your conscience telling you about this situation? We might say, you know, I found sometimes that I can find answers to my problems in reading the Bible. If I gave you some scriptures specific to your problem, would you be willing to read them? We could say, wow, things are sure crazy lately. Do you think God might be trying to tell us something through all this? John the Baptist, he didn't say, listen, he said, look. How about, did you see that post on Facebook about that Christian organization who provided all that help to victims of the hurricane? What about, I know you're pretty angry about those people, but when I remember that they are made in the image of God, just like you and I are, then I see them in a different light. What about, man, every time I see a sunset like that, I'm reminded of the immense beauty of God's creation. I just can't believe that this came about by chance. What about Jesus? 
Jesus and his questions. What are you seeking? You know, evangelism, the, the easiest way to do evangelism is to ask questions. And then listen to the answers. What if we said something like, boy, a lot of people are sure scared about COVID. Do you wish you had more peace in your life? What are you seeking? Boy, I can remember playing that rat race game, always looking for success. I didn't find it in business, though. Do you sometimes feel like there must be more to life than this? Or what about, it's hard to answer the question why bad things happen to good people, but I do think there are answers. Would you like to discuss it over coffee sometime? Andrew and Philip, they brought people to Jesus. In fact, the only time that we ever hear about Andrew, he's always bringing somebody to Jesus. He brings the little boy with the fishes and the loaves. He brings uh, a Gentile who, who's interested in seeing Jesus. I mean, that's, that's what Andrew does. And, and interestingly enough, we don't really hear much about Philip. Um, but the idea is that, that bringing someone to Christ, number one, can significantly impact the kingdom of God. We don't hear much about Andrew, but we sure hear a lot about his brother Peter. And Peter came to Christ because Andrew brought him. Any of you know who Mordecai Ham was? It's not a Bible person. It's... Anybody? Mordecai Ham was the guy who brought Billy Graham to Christ. Okay? We don't know Mordecai Ham, but we sure know his legacy because he was persistent enough to bring Billy Graham to Christ, to introduce him to Jesus. Your bringing someone to Christ certainly impacts them. We hardly ever hear about Philip or Nathaniel again, but, we, but they were disciples of Christ. Andrew and Philip immediately brought others to Jesus. Now, Personally, I can remember when I came to, to Christ in, in college, and I went out and I told the world about Jesus. I did more witnessing in probably the first couple of years than, than since. And, and I, want, I want to encourage you to remember that zeal and that fire that we had as young people who were on fire for Jesus. Because honestly, as older people, we don't necessarily burn out, but sometimes there's just embers. And so remember what Jesus told the church. He said, remember your first love. Recapture that love. Nathaniel. So introducing someone to Jesus isn't just about head knowledge, it's about experiencing him. Remember that Nathaniel's initial reaction when he was told about Jesus was to reject what he heard. But Philip's response to that was, come and see. And when Nathaniel actually experiences Jesus, he like goes over the top. He says, Rabbi, Savior, King of Israel. That experience of Jesus can be so much more than just hearing about Jesus, that head knowledge. And so evangelism involves showing. How about this? I know you find it hard to believe everything I've told you about who Jesus is. But let me show you how he's changed my life and the life of others who go to my church. What about this? Hey, neighbor. Even though we've lived next to each other for years, I don't really know you very well. I'd like to change that. Would you come over for dinner next Tuesday? Bring the kids. Nothing fancy, just a chance to talk over a hot, hot meal. And then be sure to say grace during that meal. Be sure to, to, to live out your Christian life. How about this? Hey, I know a lot of people have said things like, you are in my prayers, but I'd like to pray for you right now, if that's okay with you. Kind of the last 
thing to think about with this is, did, did I come to Jesus or did he come to me? Nathaniel would have told you that he came to Jesus. Jesus would say he came to Nathaniel under the fig tree. Andrew and Philip might say that they came to Jesus. Or Andrew and Peter might say they came to Jesus, but Philip would say Jesus came to him. And so here's the thing. There's an internal calling to which we must respond. There's an external calling as well. That internal calling is, is the Holy Spirit. It's God saying, follow me. It's God calling Samuel three times. It's that internal calling that comes from the Holy Spirit. The external calling comes from you and I. It comes when we say, here I am, and when we say, come and see. Our job is not to do the internal calling. Our job is to do the come and see. I want to close with uh, a rather lengthy quote, but it's a good one. Um, J. Wilbur Chapman is a Presbyterian, was a Presbyterian evangelist. He was part of a group that went around the country. <clears throat> this is called If. If to be a Christian is worthwhile, then the most ordinary interest in those with whom we come in contact would prompt us to speak to them of Christ. If the New Testament be true, and we know that it is, who has given us the right to place the responsibility for soul winning on other shoulders than our own? If they who reject Christ are in danger, is it not strange that we, who are so sympathetic when the difficulties are physical or temporal, should apparently be so devoid of interest as to allow our friends and neighbors and kindred to come into our lives and pass out again without a word of invitation to accept Christ, to say nothing of sounding a note of warning because of their peril? If today is the day of salvation, if tomorrow may never come, and if life is equally uncertain, how can we eat, drink, and be merry when those who live with us, work with us, walk with us, and love us are unprepared for eternity because they are unprepared for time? If Jesus called his disciples to be fishers of men, who gave us the right to be satisfied with making fishing tackle or pointing the way to the fishing banks? instead of going ourselves to cast out the net until it be filled. If Jesus himself went seeking the lost, if Paul the Apostle was in agony because his kinsmen, according to the flesh, did not know Christ, why should we not consider it worthwhile to go out after the lost until they were found? This next one is the one that got me. If I am to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, to render an account for the deeds done in the body. What shall I say to him if my children are missing, if my friends are not saved, or if my employer or employee should miss the way because I have been faithless? If I wish to be approved at the last, then let me remember that no intellectual superiority, no eloquence in preaching, no absorption in business, no shrinking temperament, or no spirit of timidity can take the place or be an excuse for my not making an honest, sincere, prayerful effort to win others to Christ. Brothers and sisters, we're called to evangelize. We're called to spread the gospel. And if we're going to call ourselves Christians and disciples of Jesus and followers of Jesus, then we need to be about Jesus' business. Jesus spent more time with the lost and the least and the lonely than he did with the people in church. We need to be about that same business. Asking questions, saying, come and see. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that, uh, that we are a part of your kingdom. We thank you for our own salvation. But Lord, we know that, that we are not called to rest upon that alone. Lord, we are called to spread your word, to bring light into darkness, to bring healing and salvation and reconciliation and peace.
And Lord, we know that, that it is not we who bring that about in the end. It is you, the Holy Spirit, that brings that about. But we also know, Lord, that we are privileged to be a part of that process. So give us courage, Lord. Give us encouragement and wisdom. Help us to see the many opportunities that you provide for us. And then let us act upon them. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for putting the Holy Spirit into John and for giving John the words that we needed to hear, giving us direction that we needed, giving us questions that we need to ask. Let us put those into our hearts, inwardly digest them, and outwardly spew them. Help us remember his eloquent words and maybe his simple words that you gave to him that he shared with us. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. Um, page 5. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified as a conscious pilot. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Almighty and ever-living God, we are taught by your holy word to offer prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people. We humbly ask you mercifully to receive our prayers. Inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth unity and concord, and grant that all who confess your name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the way of righteousness, and so guide and direct their leaders, especially Donald, our president, that your people may enjoy the blessings of freedom and peace and grant that our leaders may impartially administer justice, uphold integrity and truth, restrain wickedness and vice, and protect true religion and virtue. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests, and deacons, especially to your servants, Foley, our Archbishop, Keith, our Bishop, John, our Priest, Gretchen, our deacon, that by their life and teaching they may proclaim your true and life-giving word, and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. And to all your people give your heavenly grace, especially to this congregation, that with reverent and obedient hearts we may hear and receive your holy word, and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prosper, we pray, all those who proclaim the gospel of your kingdom throughout the world. <clears throat> Strengthen us to fulfill your great commission, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all that you have commanded. 
Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We ask in your goodness, O oh Lord, to comfort and sustain, sustain all those who are in this transitory life, are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Jennifer, Leslie, Aaron, Caitlin, Doris, Karen, Valerie, Michelle, Anne, baby Keisha, Luke, Anne, Bishop Keith, Julie, Stan, Tim, Alba, Jim, Ava and Jim, Marlene, Glenn, Leanne, Duncan, Bert, Gretchen, Betty, Carla, Margie, Larry, Keisha in her studies, and those you now name. Jim in his studies. Lift up Karen and Eric and Kathy and Lucretia for healing from COVID. <coughs> Stephanie. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember before you all your servants who have departed this life in your faith and fear, especially Valerie, that your will for them will be fulfilled. And we ask you to give us grace to follow the good examples of all your saints, that we may share with them in your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your gracious care in keeping all the men and women of our armed forces and first responders at home and abroad. Defend them day by day with your heavenly grace. Strengthen them in their trials and temptations. Give them courage to face the perils which beset them and grant them a sense of your abiding presence wherever they may be. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may abide in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. Please greet one another. Hi online. Peace, sir. Peace, sir. Peace, sir. Peace, sir. Peace, sir. And our offertory family. Our offertory hymn is Lamb of God. Ascribe unto the Lord the things. I think the verse there. Sorry. Ascribe unto the Lord the honor to his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts with praise and thanksgiving.
We will sing this one a cappella.
eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of life, of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by the, your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And in the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, together. By him and with him and in him, in the liberty and honor of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia! Together. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Every now and then I get struck by certain words in, in the liturgy. We do not presume to come to this, your table. Your table. This is God's table. What a privilege that we have to be able to approach it, to share in God's feast. Praise God. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Please be seated. All baptized Christians are welcome to receive communion with us today. If you would prefer not to receive, we still encourage you to come forward. You can place your arms over your chest in the form of a cross, and I'll know to give you a blessing. Uh, if you choose to stay where you are, that's okay too. Um, but we long for the day when you might love the Jesus that we love and might be able to partake in the family meal of which we are about to partake.
start on this side too. Heavenly Father, 
We thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. May the love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for some announcements. Um, birthdays. Leanne had a birthday. And Keisha had a birthday. Any other birthdays or anniversaries? My, my daughter Stephanie had her 43rd birthday yesterday. Stephanie, 43. All right. You're not supposed to tell me. Oh, that's all right. Let's pray. She's Heavenly right. Father, we thank you uh, for life. Uh, not only physical life, Lord, but spiritual life. We praise you and glorify you for the lives of people that have been celebrating birthdays this week. We ask that you would continue to bless them, continue to work in them and through them, and all to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anybody traveling? Anybody who has a story about sharing the Christian life? I, I may count that with my older cousin um, over the Christmas holiday, talking about my wife's death, and she told me about her husband. And she sent me a beautiful letter the other day. We redo our, our attachment to each other, which has been severed by space and time, but we both shared some really nice feelings about it. Oh, all right, so it's, it's really helpful. Yeah, thanks, Tom. You have a letter, don't you? Um, yes, somewhere. <laughs> It basically was... It yeah, basically, I mean, you don't have to read it, but you can tell us about it. Well, it was from uh, CLDI, thanking us for our gracious gift for the Christmas stores, and uh, said it helped a lot, and the Christmas stores were very well received. So I was talking um, yesterday with um, my horse trainer, and, uh, and kind of two things came up in conversation. One, we had just um, finished playing with cows, and, um, and I asked her, because they're doing this series uh, once a month, uh, this reigning cow horse competition, I said, do you think that the people that are organizing this would be interested in my coming and blessing the horses? And she said she didn't know. Um, but it actually got, she said, you know, I've never heard of blessing horses. And, and so we talked about blessing um, a little bit. We talked about, um, you know, differences there. And, and then the other thing was, um, uh, we talked about, we were talking about how often I came for lessons and, and I made the comment that, that my old trainer had said that you've got to come more than once a week if you're really going to progress. And I said, you know, that's kind of like being a Christian and just going to church once a week. That's not enough. And, and that's it. I mean, there wasn't any big, and, and she's a Christian anyway, but there wasn't any big um, theological debate. It was just simple statements introduced into the normal conversation. So again, that's what I encourage you to do. Every week we're going to ask this question, so you guys might as well get used to it. You know, what, what Christian conversations have you had? All right? And, and just how were you able to introduce Christ or Christian living or Bible or whatever into your everyday conversation? So, be ready for that next week. Our closing hymn is... John. No, it's not John. Go ahead. Why do you We've all been praying for Luke now for about four months, and I got a message from his father yesterday that he has been released from the hospital in Denver and is now in outpatient treatment. So our prayers have worked. 
Thank you all for your constant prayers for Luke and his family. What was Luke? He had acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which required, well, he actually had two bone marrow transplants. The second one took really well. So he is out of the hospital and out of the super sanitary area and out of humanity again. So praise God for that. Yes. Please stand. Our uh, closing hymn is Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing.